on a proverb about working together, and we started with the Irish proverb, Nina Oscar Curla Kayla, so there's a nice top and tail to that, so thank you, Magnus. Um, I feel that this is a great room to be in because if we're talking about uh, digitizing the, the grids that we all need in our power supply, but the threat of that is actually cybersecurity, so perhaps we've got the right people in the room to talk to each other. Um, and I think there's, there will be lots of questions from the audience, but it just seems pertinent to me to actually speak to Christine, first of all, because if Denmark is so far ahead of all the other countries in terms of offshore wind, um, and we have a lot to learn in Ireland, and, and as I said, I think there's uh, offshore wind farms to be built in, 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 in the very near future down in Cork, but you have the lessons learned, and you've also told us that what really needs to happen is for all of these neighboring countries to work together because the parks need to be cross-border, actually. So can you just speak a little bit more to that, since we have partners in the room, about what you would envisage uh, for that future? Well, I, th I think that the countries, and, and just uh, basically the, so the framework that uh, we discussed for just a minute ago could provide some of, uh, at least the framework for the discussions to take place. Um, the industry itself is also driving this basically across, across Europe, sitting down, talking together what is needed for this actually to, uh, to, to, to be realized, because it's very difficult. Um, um, and it's going to take some time. But mm -hmm. the, most, I think, the most important thing is that we realize that this is the way forward. This is basically the only way we can decarbonize um, Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot more focus has, has to be sort of put into this now. It, until now, it's been a, sp a question of economy. It's basically the technology was too expensive. So everything was about yeah. one member state basically having its own support system. Now it's not so much um, a question of economy anymore. Um, so now we basically need to sit together finding the way, right framework for this to continue and the international organization has a huge responsibility to making certain mm. that this is going to happen and then the industry of course has to be able to deliver but I think that that's not actually a problem. Okay, great, thank you. So I'll, I'll open the floor um, to questions and if you can, uh, I'll take this, this lady at the front, she's in the second row, thank you. The gentleman behind her then. Hello, um, Christine, you mentioned like pol politicians need to listen. Um, so let's say they do listen and we get a bunch more wind farms. Um, what do we do about regulations and following them? Because we're currently paying millions to the EU because we didn't follow environmental impact assessments. And like a water, uh, in water fair, the wind, a wind farm is currently being shut down because planning wasn't followed. So permission of planning wasn't followed. So what do you think politicians should do once they start listening? I think it's very important, as we talked about before, that you sort of have this dialogue and you have both with constituency and the people have a much more dialogue what actually has to happen to making certain that we actually get the wind farms up and, um, um, and running. We have exactly the same issues in Denmark right away. We see this as one of the major obstacles for actually reaching the goals is public resistance. So everybody in Denmark is talking climate. Everybody mm. loves to be green. Uh, we see people are switching their diet it's away from meat, we're, we're seeing an interest in, in finding other ways of transportation. But when it comes to having uh, a windmill nearby or a PV, then uh, nobody really likes it anymore. Then, so we need to have this discussion. We also need to have some hard regulation maybe, harder regulation saying that this is a necessity and then much, much faster, fast track procedures, planning procedures when we're talking about green, green technology. Mm -hmm. Can I follow up on that question because I think it's a great question um, and just for yourself Eric because you said that you had cross-party agreement that you were going to meet these goals um, and you had those targets but they didn't just go in a policy and were kind of you know there written down somewhere with no one following them they were actually important so is there lessons that we can learn from Norway in that regard? Yeah, I think that's uh, one of the key success factors was that all the parties, maybe apart from one party, agreed on uh, this target and they also agreed that um, we should use the means that we have, which are the measures that we have, which is the tax system, to promote the target, mm. the achievement of the target. And uh, that we have always had very high taxes, of course, so we have a lot to play with when it comes to the incentive structure. So we can remove 
taxes and then you have a big incentive. And removing taxes is much easier uh, and more effective than having a grant. Yes. A grant mm. is based mm, okay. on a government, uh, and the government has to, 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 to issue money to the, the, the mm. company that gives out the grant. If you, if you, if you have a tax e exemption, you just lose income. It's a much easier system. Mm. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it's more stable. It, uh, you could also have a bonus model system that would operate more or less in the same way. Because then the government expenditures are not involved. You, you have a, a model, so you have to pay extra to buy a, a gas, gasoline or diesel car, and then you get the, that is used to finance a, a bonus to those who buy an electric mm -hmm. car. Mm -hmm. That can be done uh, cost neutral for the government, for instance. Mm -hmm. but yeah, you have a lot of tools if you have a target and you want to meet the target, you just have to start using the tools. But you also have to convince them to have the target. Targets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we'll come back to Alex, but I'll just take a couple more questions. This gentleman here, um, and there's another gentleman here after that. We'll bundle them in. Thank you. Uh, you can hear me. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, the question is to Christine, but perhaps uh, other members of the panel may wish to uh, comment as well. In terms of, you, you talked about technological advances. And obviously, one assumes that also means efficiency. Uh, and I'm surprised that not to hear more about energy storage. And perhaps you might say a word about uh, in Denmark uh, on energy storage, uh, both at grid level or national level, and then more particularly about uh, a residential or commercial new build. What's happening there? OK. Um, can I take another question? We'll, we'll bundle those and get it to take to your question, please. Um, I have a deep concern that there is a fundamental flaw at the heart of this discussion, and that is statistical reliability. With all due respect to the EA in Copenhagen, um, I will only have confidence in the reliability of our climate change statistics in Europe when the management of our statistical databases are, is taken over by Eurostat in Luxembourg. Okay, um, so I'm not sure uh, any of our panel can address that, but we'll note that comment certainly. Uh, so if we come back to the issue of energy storage, I know it's addressed to you, Christine, but actually it's something that I wanted to ask um, Magnus as well, because hydrogen wasn't really coming there, and, and, and hydrogen is a way of storing energy as well in, in a cleaner, greener way. So Christine, if you'd like to, to come to that first. Well, I could talk 10 minutes or an hour on uh, hydrogen alone. I think, as I just shortly mentioned, this is going to be one of the future technologies, and this is very much where all the focus in Denmark is being put into right now. Um, so I, I would envisage that we will see um, some of the first test hydrogen um, facilities in connection with offshore wind being sort of um, the next step because hydrogen is basically the way that we see that we will be able to store the energy. Um, and also, I think it's going to be interesting to see whether or not we can engage in a new cooperation with the oil and gas industry, because there might be an opportunity to use some of the existing infrastructure, um, basically to transport the hydrogen in the future. So some of the pipelines might be useful for, for basically um, getting the hydrogen to, towards um, the customers. So this is basically the only thing, power to X, um, being talked about in Denmark now, and I think um, the politicians here will also will go and engage with them in how to combine the next offshore wind park. Maybe the tendering process um, has to be connected with um, facilities that can produce hydrogen, and that's where the support has to go next. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Christine. Magnus, can you speak yeah, to that I energy say, storage yes, question we, as well? <clears throat> first of all, we, we are very blessed with the, with the hydropower in, in, in the Nordics. I mean, that's really our, our big battery. Uh, mm -hmm. And that can be developed further, for sure, to be to be even more flexible. But but then we should also consider uh, yeah, hydrogen is that will come for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's all, it's also a matter of cost. I mean, we I think we have lower hanging fruits that we can use this what we call sector coupling between, for example, the heat and electricity exactly, system, yeah. mm -hmm. and actually use the the, the um, inertia, thermal inertia in, in, in buildings and so on. And, mm -hmm. and the, the, that 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 should be, and it's actually getting more and more used, but, but I think we are, we are just starting. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I think we can do a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but do you think that it, those developments will happen in time for us to meet those measurable targets? I mean, I mean for example, we, we need to see that the 
price volatility will go up so it can actually be part of the of the of the of the revenue i mean if you make an investment and uh, for yeah, storage on any 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 kind it must the value must be high i, I mean the value should go up in time <coughs> with more wind for example and solar to be there okay thank you magnus and there's an, another question over here this gentleman if we get the microphone Donald Valakan, I want to ask the Danish lady and perhaps other members of the panel a question arising from a conference uh, here a month ago which the IIEA were also um, uh, involved in organizing. During that conference, the Oxford uh, energy economist uh, Dieter Helms talked about in terms of auctions for uh, renewable power, whether it's solar or for wind or whatever else it might be, he mentioned that it should be based on equivalent firm power, which means that when the wind isn't blowing adequately to generate power, and also when the sun isn't shining, that the price um, uh, awarded should be based on equivalent firm power. Is that a practice that's coming in in uh, Denmark or any place else in the uh, uh, Nordic uh, countries? Yeah. Maybe I can say that, I mean, already, I mean, I sometimes I speak with the wind developers, and they say they, 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 they actually project that they get 10% less, less paid yes. in a number of years from now for wind. I mean, it's actually paid less, mm. because when the wind is there, the price goes down, and when there's no wind, of course, you get nothing. So, I mean, and there in between, you get good, good pay. But, I mean, it's actually, it should be taken by the market that is hour by hour, I mean, so... So the, the answer is that, but still wind is being built with, I would say, no subsidies in Sweden for the moment. I mean, they, they don't cal calculate for any subsidies, but still they wind big, build a lot of big uh, wind uh, power, um, um, yeah. Hmm. Um, and is this something that you were talking about, the digitization, sorry, the digitization <laughs> of the grid? Uh, if, if something like that is happening where less power is getting generated and we can tell immediately because it's digitized, is that something where the, the pay will be flexible for it? Could, could the digitization assist with that, or is it, is it a benefit? I'm not sure. Uh, maybe that's another thing. I mean, it's more, I would say, it's more better utilization of the assets. I mean, if it would be transmission lines or, or, or uh, 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 energy storage or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's better utilization. And, and then mm -hmm. we should not forget uh, that it's, uh, it's very important to to, to uh, connect larger and larger areas. I mean, the more you connect, the more less, 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 less likely is that it will not blow uh, any wind any, anywhere. I mean, mm. if, you, if you connect larger areas, mm. you, 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 you need less of storage because you have more power transmission if you talk, talk electricity. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Alex, can I bring this to you? Because mm. the connectivity, if we looked at the mm. Balmoral model, yeah. you know, Ireland is very <laughs> isolated. Other yeah. countries yeah. are very isolated yeah. in terms of you might be depending on Russian oil, etc. But we are very isolated. We have one pipeline at the minute. Yeah. Is this? Are, are these conversations that have been happening in government? And oh, yeah. if we go back to that question that the first lady had, you know, how can we convince the politicians to yes, listen, and then act on uh, on the concerns? Yeah. Well, just on the connectivity, that's been a big preoccupation of ours, and in fact, it's all the more relevant now and topical now in the context of Brexit. So that the connectivity that Ireland has, the island of Ireland, don't forget we have a, on the electricity side, we have an integrated electricity market in Ireland, on the island of Ireland, north and south. And we need to have our connection and our connectivity to the, to the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. And it's essential, so there's an initiative with France at the moment, which is, I think is terrific. And I think that need, we need more initiatives like that to ensure that you know, we have, we have that, sophist, that high level of connectivity, that it's a policy driver for us, as well as being something that will actually you know, really pay dividends in terms, of our, uh, in terms of cost and for all sorts of reasons, and the variability of wind and solar and all of these issues that we all have to address all the time. So absolutely, that's critical. I mean, uh, uh, what was this que the, 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 the question you asked me? Because I was just responding the, to what he was saying. The, the, the second, well, so that, that's the yeah. connectivity. The second question was, we, you know, we've been discussing, um, oh, Eric gave us the example yeah. that the politicians decided all together yeah. this is going to be our goal. Yeah. And we have that on paper that it's a goal yeah. here, but really... It's funny, political decisions, missed, what's happening? political decisions happen 
kind of over a period of time. And very often when, I say, when, when people say the politicians, because of course the politicians is not an undifferentiated thing. There are lots of different politicians. So, and there are lots of different politicians with different ideas and different approaches and different levels of commitment and so on. So I, I, I think that it's not an undifferentiated thing, but I think more and more of the politicians are realizing now that they have to engage with this because it's a critical economic imperative that we complete, that we adjust hugely the way we consume energy. And big decisions have to be made by governments. So yes. very often at conferences, people say, oh, it's about, or, or people will say, well, it's about individual action. Of course it's about individual action. But the system has to facilitate individuals to change. Mm -hmm. yes, you cannot expect people, you know, millions of different people just to make all of these separately motivated decisions to do the right thing. Exactly. The system, the way we configure our system has to facilitate those changes mm -hmm. in individual behavior. Maybe just one idea that I personally like, it's not the organization, but me, is that you for example, <coughs> would put the electricity tax as, as a percentage of the spot price on the market, for example. That would make mm. like a gain that when the spot pr price goes up, it goes real, then taxes goes up also. So mm. it's not the same sec per kilowatt hour, it's mm. actually percentage. Of, I mean, that could be one mm. way to really make, I mean, that would make flexibility and storage mm. more profitable. I mean, as if, if they dare to do it, the politicians, mm -hmm. I wouldn't know if I would do it, but I mean... <laughs> <laughs> good luck, yeah, good luck. But, but it, it, at least it would work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess it's important to throw those ideas around yeah. and trash yeah. them out because yeah. of the future that's there. Yeah. Well, I'd like to sure. thank sincerely all of our panellists, Eric Fiegenbaum, Christine van het erwe Grunet, Alex White and Magnus Olofsons for uh, a very, very interesting conversation on sustainability. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.